Good morning, everybody. I hope everybody's having a, a, a good Saturday morning. It's very cold outside. It's beautiful outside, but it's freezing. Um, <clears throat> I know the, uh, the overflow shelters were open um, last night, and I believe that they're going to be open again tonight. We're in the middle of this really, really bad cold wave, and yeah. um, we want everybody to stay really, really safe. Um, the other thing, and I'll mention it again, um, when we start, Don, uh, this is not, um, it's been a, um, a difficult week for the city um, with, the, um, with the shooting on uh, um, Thursday with um, this um, murder-suicide yesterday, a lot of um, really very sad news that's coming through. And uh, it may take a little while to kind of um, unwind all that stuff, but um, a difficult week for a lot of people. And uh, anyway, um, we're here with Don Harden, who is the president of the Don Harden Group. Uh, Don, welcome. Thanks for being a guest on my show today. Thank you. you. Doing okay? Thank you for having me, Jim. I'm doing great. Good. Well, Saturday morning. Well, we, we, typically, um, we typically ask um, you, before we get everybody on, kind of a, uh, a non-relevant question. And I was asking you about those beams that were uh, behind your head. What, what are those? They really look very, very good. Oh, those are those are precast beams, um, and uh, you know this is this is. I'm in our office. I'm in our new office on Buchanan Street, mm -hmm. um, and we took an existing building, which used to be the the uh, the Little Scholars Building, daycare center on on Buchanan, 14th Buchanan, and um, and uh, giving credit to my CFO, who's very talented, Tracy Hart, and she decided. Hey, we ought to paint those a color. We wanted to paint them. We didn't want to be one. We didn't want to black it out with just black. So, so she picked a color. And and um, while when, when we were painting it under construction, everybody thought it was weird, but it turned out pretty well. So, you know, it looks really, really good. And and this Tracy, is she any relationship to you? Yes, she's been my wife for uh, about thirty-one years. All right, and she's and, the and, and, and she manages our money. So. Okay. All right. That's probably a very good thing. So, um, um, Thanks, so um, we've still got another minute or so. And I said, I was going to ask you another irrelevant question. So probably the hardest question maybe of, of um, today would be, um, should the Titans have gone for um, the, uh, just the, the kick after the touchdown or should they've gone for two? What's your, what's your Ooh. feeling on it? Oh, I, I clearly think they should have just gone for, for the extra point. You know, that's a trick to just, you know, you can have to keep football simple and you step up your game in playoffs, but, but you don't want to make some bad risk early on. And so literally, I think that if it had been 17 to 16, as my son said, they could have run the clock down at that point. But but when, when it was tied up, they were forced to do something else. So that, that turned out to be a bad a bad choice to to uh, go for go for two. Well, it's, it, it's always easy to go back and look at it. I was thinking about the same thing you, you just said, and that was if they'd gotten the point, they would have, at the end, they would have just sat on the ball. Yeah, would have been, but, but, you, but also giving credit to, to the Titans and the coach, you know, we, we're, we're in our living rooms making these, these calls, you know, in the comforts yeah. of, our, of our living room. I happen to have been at the game, though, actually. But, uh, but anyway. I, was, I was at the game, too, and, um, but nobody asked me what I thought at the time. No, they didn't come up to my section and say and find me and say, "Hey, man, what, we, what should we do?" You know what they could have done was just do a survey, an immediate survey, and everybody decides, and then the coach looks at it and then chooses the other option or whatever. Right. Um, right. Anyway, it was it was a um, it was not the best played game in the world, uh, but it was um, certainly you know it was interesting that all I think somebody said that all playoff games last week were decided on the last play. Every game, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, really, the defense really played well. The defense stepped up. The yeah. offense was a little bit this, you know, unorganized, and and uh, the quarterback got us to where we got to this year. But he made some bad plays that, that they picked the wrong time to not play well. Offense, at least offense. Yeah. So, and, that, and sometimes that happens. Sports. That's how it goes in sports. That's that's what happens. Yeah. Well, my guest today is uh, Don Harden, who's the president of the Don Harden Group. Uh, Don, we really appreciate you being here. Uh, we got a lot of questions. Uh, I have uh, the county clerk, Brenda Wynn, is on. So, uh, Brenda, welcome. And um, anyway, Good morning. 
Hello to you, Brenda. Good morning. Hey, Don. Hey, Jim. Hey, Brenda. Any, any organ music going this morning, Jim? Uh, thank you, Brenda. Uh, and, <laughs> and please mute yourself. <laughs> I will. That's a kind of a private joke right now. <laughs> but apparently, um, 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 if, if Joyce McDaniel, who helps me with all this stuff, uh, has her way, everyone in the city will eventually know what Brenda's talking about. Um, anyway, um, um, as I said at the beginning, as we were letting people on, a, a very difficult week for the city. Um, a lot of things still have to be kind of uh, unraveled to figure out some of this stuff. Uh, the incident on Thursday, um, the uh, murder-suicide yesterday, um, just a really, really difficult time going on. Um, really difficult, yes. Um, and um, I will say it's obviously cold outside. Um, uh, thanks to a number of different agencies around the city and Metro Social Services. Uh, we have shelters open tonight. Um, um, actually, we have two. One, the, the, the initial Metro overflow shelter and the Salvation Army is opened up over on Stockwell Street. And I was there the other night and they had about 160, 170 people in there. It's really cold and um, we, we, we have to open up. This is the proper thing for our government to do is to make sure that its citizens are safe and uh, it's really, really cold. So anyone, be, everybody be very, very safe and know that a lot of stuff is going on around you to try to keep people safe. Jim, uh, I, know Don, get, I know you're gonna get into other questions, but yeah. before you leave that subject, year over year, what's the number of homeless people in Nashville? Is it increasing, decreasing? I mean, what, what, what can you tell us about that? It seems to be de uh, increasing, sorry. Uh, it's increasing, um, particularly with the pandemic and a lot of other things going on. And the city's growing, obviously. So the number is increasing. Now, what's interesting was that a Thursday night, um, the city did their point in time, um, basically, um, I don't know if you call it a, a collection, but what they're doing is they send people out across the city to try to count uh, the number of people who are um, homeless or experiencing homelessness in Nashville. And so um, it's a very interesting process. I'm looking at it. They go out kind of in the middle of the night and because they expect that people will be, um, you know, settled wherever they are. And um, it's kind of weird, but unfortunately they kind of wake people up and they're counting. So it's a point in time count. And um, so we'll know more after that comes in to see kind of what our numbers look like this time. But um, uh, the numbers we believe are increasing. And um, tell you, some of these nights, uh, those overflow shelters are just packed. So um, um, real issue, something that we have to keep working through. Um, all right, so um, my first question on my guest are um, got Don Harden. Don, tell me about yourself. Um, where are you from? What have you been doing? Um, give me a little information about yourself. Okay, I'll try to give you the uh, USA Today version of that. Um, okay. Uh, Don Harden, born and raised in Nashville. Um, uh, pretty much grew up in two, pretty much two communities in Nashville. One was originally was South Nashville, near the fairgrounds, actually, uh, on Mallory Street until I was about eight years old. And then we moved to Trinity Hills which is off of Trinity Lane. And I lived there, my mom's house is still there, in fact. Um, so uh, two places lived here in Nashville. I went to Maplewood High School, finished in the, uh, I guess I gotta be honest about my age. I had a birthday two days ago, so so I just need to be real about it. But I was I finished high school in 1983, went to TSU uh, and studied architectural engineering, graduated from there and got hired by a large construction company uh, that moved us around uh, for about 11 years. And then we moved back to Nashville. I say us because um, early on in 1990, I got married to Tracy Harden. And uh, so she was with me on all those moves. So uh, moved back to Nashville. We've been back in Nashville about 21 years now. Uh, pretty much right, maybe a year or so after we moved back, we started. He he did. He's still outside though. He's looking at the one downtown. Oh. Hold on, we're getting some feedback. Okay, go ahead, Don. Okay, um, no, no worries. So moved back to Nashville and started Don Harden Group and, and Don Harden Group does construction management. 
Uh, we're a general contractor. We've been licensed as a general contractor since 2005. Uh, a lot of people call on us to do to be the owner's rep. Uh, personally, uh, Trace and I have a 27-year-old son, Trey Harden. He's been with uh, uh, Metro Arts for five years after he finished high school. I mean, finished college at, at Howard in, in D.C. Uh, and um, you know, we 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 love we love our our team of employees. We love our you know what we do um, as a family, and we have interesting hobbies, different hobbies, and you know that's kind of kind of who we are, who I am. Very good. So um, hobbies. Hobbies, and then I'll come back to the construction stuff. What do you like to do? Oh, I, I, I love to. I like to run when I get a chance. I like the outdoors. Uh, I'm a bit. I'm an avid vinyl collector now. That's uh, increasing. Growing up, my well, raising our son, he was a big soccer player, and I tell him all the time. We kind of put our hobbies on hold, uh, chasing him around with travel soccer and all that. As soon as he was out of high school, all of a sudden, my hobby of music collecting vinyl and, and stereo equipment and all that woke, you know, woke up again. And so I'm really into that now. Uh, and, and we like to travel. So, so you will find me on my off time, uh, listening to vinyl more than likely. All right. Well, um, I was a big fan of Davy Jones and the monkeys and I think I have some of their albums. So maybe we should compare notes. All right. Okay. You, you know, if you, it, it sounds like that's probably a teenage thing when you played them. And the wreck is probably pretty scratched up. Is it, is it scratched up, John, uh, Jim? Is it in good I don't, shape? I don't know, but I'm, I'm going to go find out, and then I'll let you know. <laughs> All right. All right. A lot of people, real quick about the vinyl, a lot of people like the vinyl because they like the cracking sound. And I tell people all the time, that's because the record is dirty. You will appreciate a clean record and listen to a, a pristine vinyl. The vinyl can be played like in, in such clarity that, that you really will, will appreciate it even more. All right. Well, I'll, I'll go find something to clean it with, which will probably be the wrong right. thing. I'll help you out with that. Let me know. <laughs> okay. Well, and happy birthday. And um, uh, you're uh, you're younger than I am. I'm just letting you know. All right. So uh, anyway, um, tell me about um, uh, give uh, give the people who are watching this um, an idea of some of the some of the projects around Nashville that you've been involved with. Oh yeah, we've been fortunate to have worked on uh, one most recently. Uh, proud projects we worked on is the National Museum of African American Music. Uh, our firm was a, the, pretty much the glue that hired everybody, pulled everybody together, managed that whole process. Um, we worked on the Music City Center project as a joint venture. We teamed up with other bigger firms and, and did that project. Fun story about that. When we started a company called Harmony Construction, it was three minority entities that did that. And we first started out wanting to get into development and we wanted to buy property. And um, in the way of that, the RFP was gonna come out for someone to build a new uh, convention center at the time it was before it even got its name. One of my partners from, he was from DC and he knew about all these companies that built convention centers across the nation. He said, let's call um, a company called Clark and, and then Bell. So we were the small guy that pulled this team together and introduced Clark to Bell. And then we all, you know, of course we were the small guy we couldn't bond as much as they could. So we were the baby brother that pulled this, this these teams together. We, we, we um, proposed as a team, won it against other bidders. And, and, and so, you know, goes, goes that story. We, we, we want to tell that small business story um, when, whenever we can. Other projects we worked on, uh, we worked on Vanderbilt's common, uh, common, the Commons project when they built the uh, com freshman Commons, and they're now known as the Commons. I was the, the guy who coordinated all the different contractors on that site on behalf of Vanderbilt's campus planning and construction. Um, we also held a uh, contract for about four or five years with HCA to manage their ADA program. So every time a, uh, HCA acquired a hospital nationwide, they, they would often acquire an old hospital that didn't comply with ADA. So we had a program of architects and local contractors in that area to re retrofit that. And finally, another project we did was uh, the, the Nashville Baseball Park, the First Tennessee Park. So we teamed up with Barton, Mallow, and Bell to build that project. Interesting. And, and now, yeah, 
Go ahead. I'm sorry. So, so what I was going to say was just for people who are trying to understand kind of your role in all these things, these are, I mean, these are massive projects. What exactly does your, uh, your company do in terms of, um, I mean, it sounds like you kind of coordinate and then you bring people together to make sure that things happen like they're supposed to. Yeah. You know, and uh, that is a good question. We have three, we call we three, we have three lanes of business that we do. One is owner's rep, owner's representative, whereas we're not the general contractor, we're not the architect, but we're the guy in the middle that hires them. On projects like the, the, uh, the National Museum of African American Music and Meharry Medical College that we did the Turner Family Center, we're the owner's rep. Yeah. On the Music City Center, our other line of business is being a general contractor. And our um, third line of business that we also do is being a subcontractor to a bigger contractor. So this, so if you focus on through owner's rep, general contractor, whereas we either take on a project by ourselves or we team up. On the Music City Center, we were part of the general contractors team. So Bill, Clark, Harmony teamed up, pulled their forces together. We all provide staff on that project. We all get in the room and make decisions on things that come up as a general contractor. And general contractor's job, Jim, pretty much is to hire all the subcontractors. So general contractors or construction managers may not self-perform anything themselves. They may sub it out unless the owner says, hey, I'm okay with you pouring concrete. If you can show me you can save money, then that general contractor will, will uh, be allowed to bid on it and price of concrete. So, so in a nutshell, uh, and as a subcontractor, you know, we'll pick a trade and we, we stick with a, a couple of trades. As a subcontractor, we've been a, a concrete subcontractor We've been, we're, we're a masonry contractor. We buy our own masonry and we, we hire our own staff now for, for, for a masonry subcontracting. And then we do some, we've done some carpentry on the, on the 505. And I, I'm, I, I left out a lot of projects that we've done, but I, they seem to pop up as this question is getting that answered. On the 505 project, uh, Tony Giratana first hired me to kind of help him consult with uh, bringing on minority businesses. And then it dawned on he and the general contractor, hey, maybe Don can do a, pick up a package. We picked up the general trades package on that project as a subcontractor to Archer Western. So we had, so all the doors in the 505, all the trim, all the mirrors and those kind of things, our company uh, hired, our forces installed all those things. So we, do, so we do different things on different projects where it makes sense for us to, to fit in. So let me ask you a, a tough question. Okay. These are major projects, obviously. Tell me, tell, tell the viewer something interesting that, uh, one of the more interesting things that happened while you were doing all these things that maybe we don't know about. Any, any fun story, any something interesting that, um, that we might know about? It's it's almost it's almost too many to tell, uh, but it's a lot of fun. A lot, but most of the stories are somewhat challenging, but they but they have good endings. One story I'll tell you is on the five hundred five project. So we're you know we're working with this big company out of out of Chicago, uh, Archer Western. Archer Western has two entities. They have some a company called the Walsh Group, Walsh Group, which is their union arm and Archer Western is their non-union arm. And it was fun working with those guys. It's, we had a situation where when we, when we provided all those doors and hardware, they knew of a company out of Seattle, Washington, actually, I'm sorry, Portland, Oregon, that they wanted us to use. We buy most of our doors here from a local, couple of local companies, but the doors, when you buy doors in a building like this, you know, different doors like uh, flush wood doors may come from one uh, company or vendor, and then other interior doors may come from a vendor. Storefront doors are going to come from a different vendor. All vendors, not many vendors sell all types of doors, except there was one company in Portland, Oregon, who claimed to, to sell all these doors. They were a terrible company to work with. Come to find out, they, get, they do the same thing. They just pull different vendors uh, that don't work directly for them and kind of farm it out or, or broker yeah. it out, if you will. So <clears throat> when we presented a, our quote to Archer Weston, they were like, Don, this is great. 
but we really want our our doors to come from one source you know we want we really want our one you know one source so we said oh we agree we signed the contract that way and we had like and, and one of my guys Preston Bailey he was the project manager for that one and we sat beside each other the whole time fighting these this vendor because they were they wouldn't get their submittals in time the deliveries they couldn't control their deliveries they were coming from all over the country and when we got in trouble we took the project manager from Archer Weston over to one of our vendors here I'm like look we got a solution to this problem let's take you over to our vendor and he went and saw their shop he was blown away and yeah. he he said well why didn't we do this in the first place and 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 we're scratching our heads it's, it's always like we think we have a lot to offer and sometimes when we finally get the bigger bigger guy to listen to us then you know we think we'll be successful not that we can't learn a lot from the big guy because we do all the time but sometimes the big guy just don't listen to the small guy and trust the resources and when we have tons of stories like that, that finally, we, we finally bought the last round of doors from the local guy. And so yeah. it, it was all kind of shipping problems with the, with the other guy. And we had, we had to figure out where to store doors that would show up, we weren't ready for them. And then we had issues with whether the doors were warping or not, because they were, where, how they were stored and, and what kind of temperatures were they stored in. Um, so we had all kinds of challenges but so, you know, it's a lot of funny in between stories, you know, uh, and, and words probably wouldn't use on this call. But, but, but at the end of the day, I'm smiling and laughing about it and they're enjoying the building. So that's kind of how it, how it happens. All right. You know what would be interesting? And, and maybe we'll do this uh, because I know there's a lot of questions people want to ask today or that I'm going to ask for them. But um, the concept of doing a building like the 505, which is downtown, um, I don't know, how many stories do you remember? 45. It, 45. Yes. Okay. So the process of actually constructing that, you know, we see it going up and then all of a sudden the windows start showing up and then somewhere the units start filling up with the doors and things that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I've never exactly understood how that works. It must be fascinating to try to figure out and make sure that it all works at, so that well, you're not putting things in when they're not supposed to be put in. Well, that, that's why that's why um, you know astute developers reach out to the guys who've done this before. I mean, yeah. um, you know, I, I know that you know not to, you know Tony uh, Giratin. I know he uses a, a lot of his favorite guys here locally, but suppose a, a local guy can't do a, a sky tower, skyscraper building like that. So you have to go and find a guy who does. That's important because, like you said, how to how to get that done. I've, I've, I've had friends, uh, Walker Matthews, we, we talk all the time about, okay, if you're going to take on a job like this, watch out for this. And some of the simple things that you wouldn't think about is everybody has to get up and down that elevator. And when you're, when, when you price a job to um, install these doors and all these trim pieces and such, based on the manpower and how many, how long it might take to to do the job, you might not consider how long you have to wait on the elevator just to get up to floor 42, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. yeah. And then, um, like you said, just in time deliveries. In this day and age, everybody's waiting on windows. So, you know, it's, it's different, different products has a different turn in being behind. Right now, if the buzz on the street, that's windows are behind. So it's a lot of um, real-time information that you have to pay attention to. Uh, you have to lay out your schedule to and follow and and your schedule has to tell you when you need to order stuff. So how you do it is really put together a schedule and a budget that says, when do you need this stuff on site? You're building a project downtown. You can't store all this. You have nowhere to store it at, at certain points. You have to get uh, get floors ready to that level so you can at least decide to put all your doors that come in on level eight or whatever. You know, so that that's pretty much if you follow that kind of pattern then you can build. it's so interesting particularly times like this with covid with um uh, supply chain shut down it, oh yeah it, uh, i'm sure it's a, a very interesting time to be in this business let me let me ask you this um sure development overall in nashville um a lot of it obviously happening um what what would you tell viewers um listening uh, are we overdoing it in 
in your mind? I mean, obviously you help with these things. Um, is there a sense that um, we're just going to keep going? Um, what can well, you tell us overall um, about the development of supply and demand is, is a big thing as you, as, as you heard. And what we do, it's interesting to have a guy like me on this call and talk about community, which I, I love talking about community, but you have to understand I represent contractors and builders who we want more of this. We don't like it when we don't have anything to build, right? So if you're asking us, we want to build more, but if you're asking me as a, as a, um, a local uh, native and someone who's watching the city grow, I have different concerns. So from that perspective, my concerns would be, you know, we're, we're building a lot too fast. Um, and it feels like um, while our city has done a good job of, of, of you know, the, the, the plan of 2020, you know, when, when, when the city years ago put together these plans and then, you know, pass it through council and, and all and the zoning and planning, they come up with all these schemes of, you know, the, the, the OR, the zoning, and then we don't abide by them. So it feels like we, if we've done a good job of planning our communities and then the permitting process kind of ignores that and allows, as an example, if you have a, if you, if you have a street that's a quiet street, the streets are kind of narrow, kind of in a neighborhood like Buchanan Street or like 12 South. Mm -hmm. You put a 200 apartment, 200 condo building on it, you know, that many people now have to drive out of there onto the street. So if you do a lot of those on that same street, all of a sudden you have congestion. So it appears to me that um, somewhere we're missing the ball on, on and, and, and I say this with mixed emotion, we're mix, missing the ball on how we allow uh, developers to keep building the same type of units in the neighborhood. And when you ride down the street now, you may miss the, the service type things. You know, where are the grocery stores? Where are the, I, I like being on, on uh, Buchanan when, when uh, I couldn't get my, my, my keys right. We were getting our keys from Home Depot. And I said, well, why don't we try Bud's, right? I can just walk down the street and went in there and five minutes later, I'm walking out and those keys work better than the ones at Home Depot. But what if somebody buys Bud's out and builds another row of condos? And so those type of services are going away because, but, but again, I'm speaking for the, the I'm, I'm, I'm the guy who likes to build this stuff. <laughs> but at the same time, if, I'm, if I have my office here and I'm dwelling in this place, what about the services? So I would think that if we're not, um, while, we're, while we're building with, with speed and, and growth, you know, on an accelerated way, who's paying attention to the services and the other common things that still should be in the neighborhood? Well, and I think that's a really, um, it's a great comment because, you know, as we come in, we see all this stuff happening, but then we worry that <clears throat> nobody, there's no plan. You know, so things just pop up and nobody's worrying about grocery stores or hardware stores or things like that. What, um, maybe this is the way to ask this. From a developer standpoint, do you all think through that? I know you want to develop. I know big companies want to come in and build big projects, but is there some thought process to, if I build this giant complex, there needs to be a grocery store nearby or something like that? Absolutely. Because um, um, a, a lot of folks, and I hear that all the time, even clients, I'm not always, uh, oftentimes I'm, I'm on the listen to the developer, listen to that uh, landowner or property owner who wants to do something with their property. And they're trying, they, well, they ask, what would be good here? What would fit? I like to hear that question. You don't often hear that question. But what you do hear more of is how many units can I get on this site? If I zone, if I'm, you know, that that's the due diligence that, that most folks are using these days to buy a property. You know, if I, if I can get uh, four units on it, then it's worth whatever the owner's asking. But if I can't get, if I can only get one, one or two, then I'm going to pass on buying that property. So more often than not, that question, the latter question gets asked more than, um, hey, what would be good for the neighborhood? That's the question that, that should be asked more. How do you, uh, and 
because you kind of uh, you're you know on the development side, but you also have concerns about neighborhoods. Um, is there a better way to for us to make sure that people that that we don't overdevelop and overdo it? I, I guess you know if you build all these residential units, eventually, uh, hopefully, a grocery store would come in because there's so much pocket of people, but um, you do worry, I mean, I think we do worry that we're overdoing it in some aspects. Well, you know, I think, you know, I don't wanna assume that what should be going on isn't going on. What I mean by that is, I, I know that that plan in Nashville, I, I have a property in, in Bordeaux, and when I went to get it rezoned, you know, there was a, there was a process you have had to go through and it was already like a map that says uh we'll allow uh you know and this is this street is going you know certain type of corridor and planning would allow certain things when they when they recommend a zoning change and they would they would say you know what if you want to get it changed to or 20 office residential you know mix of 20 then you know uh that seemed to fit the neighborhood to fit our plan so in some cases it does seem like we have a plan that somebody's following but i think the council people need to be more in tune to that to make sure that when uh, a comrade or a developer or whoever comes to them and say hey well, i want to change the zoning and it, it can't just be about um well the the, the property next door chain went from R rs to a rm and you ought to be able to do it too. Well, maybe you, maybe there's a limit on, on the numbers of RMs for that block. You know, I don't, I don't know if that's, and so again, I, I, don't, I don't sit in the room to see if they're actually checking those boxes or they just saying, that's what I meant by ignoring the plan that's already been laid out. They said, you know what? The neighbor, even though it's only designed to have 200 units on this block, we've already, we've already uh, approved 175 and that is neighbor wants to do you know 50 well maybe maybe discussion needs to be had about before they allow that other you know overage if you will so I, I don't know if that's current or not let me let me ask you this um so we're not the first city to grow you know significantly you travel a lot um tell me a city or two that you've been in where you look around and go gee they they seem to be doing this right Anybody, any city that comes to mind? Seattle, Washington. Okay. And For why do you say Seattle? Why do you say Seattle? Because, you know, I, I had to do some work in Tacoma. And, you know, it was, it was Seattle's one of those places where I said, you know, I've never been to Seattle. And it's like somebody heard me. And uh, we had a uh, business opportunity there for about four years or so. And so I was going to Tacoma all the time. You know, you fly into Tacoma, Washington, Tacoma, Seattle. Uh, T T cap or whatever they call that uh, airport, and so you have you know you spend time in Seattle and it just looked like a, a well planned neighborhood, uh, well planned community. Um, you know I'm sure they have their problems. I, I think that they have a, a higher population of homeless people than we do, and and you know they seem to to try to throw some financial solutions to it. But Seattle struck me as a place that's planned. They have a. They had more cranes than we did when I was. You know, I, it was probably. I was probably haven't been back to Seattle in the last two years or so. But Seattle, uh, probably from 2016 to 20, 2018, 2019, I was going to Seattle on a regular basis, and would see that city just looked like a well planned city for the growth that it had. So, see, I'd say definitely say Seattle. Okay, let me let me ask you this because um, I've heard this before. Um, the the way Nashville has been developed or developed over the many years as it was growing, um, it doesn't look like we made our streets big enough or we had enough sidewalks or other things like that. How difficult is that as a developer to try to figure out how to build around that type of stuff, particularly if you're building downtown? You know, it's very difficult. I think that, uh, but it's, it's, it's not the first. I mean, you know, um, places like New York City and all, you know, uh, some streets are... are are wider. Uh, Chicago seemed to have done well with that. Um, and, and, you know, of course, we've tried the one way streets, but it, it, it has to be from a developer's buildings perspective, it has to be on time, 
uh, delivery on materials, basically. And, uh, and, and a lot of projects I'm working on now, <clears throat> we have a project we're starting up with Vanderbilt on the, on the, the athletic side. We were fortunate enough to win some work there. And we're already talking about uh, when storing material because nowadays, you know, with deliveries, you have to buy stuff pretty early. But when it comes in, how are you going to store it? So I, th I imagine downtown, and you know, it's, it's people who are doing that much um, with much more experience than I than I have downtown. Um, is you have to deal with a lot of on time and a lot of uh, after hours, late night deliveries. Um, you know, clo street closures and, and working with Public Works. Public Works, they do an excellent job. I, I will say our Public Works department here in Nashville, uh, they do a great job. I, I mean, you know, guys like Rory, um, but in, a guy in his position, he will make himself available and come and walk walk the job and see what's going on and, and help you. So I think that our Public Works guys and planning and, um, and, and the fact that the Public Works team have seen when you don't do things well, I mean, you have to deal with bike lanes while construction is going on. They have to deal with how to negotiate with the folks who are, are you know, waving the bike flag, which I, I'm happy about too. So we all have to coexist. So it has to be a lot of communication, Jim. I think that's the best way to do it. It's like, hey, we all got to get, and that's where we approach projects. Yeah. You know, it all has to get done. What if you came in at, from 11 to seven, I'll come in from seven to five, you know, so that kind of thing has, has to happen. Tell me, um, okay, so let's switch over to Buchanan Street. Um, what do you, what are you, what are you doing over there? What, what is your um, the kind of short-term plan, long-term plan? Um, what's going on on Buchanan Street? Well, uh, we've committed to being here. We, you know, um, uh, our office. We've moved our office four or five times before we finally settle on. We're going to be here for a while because we made a financial commitment. And um, you know, from as a as a co-developer and as a as a leasey to ourselves, a leaser to ourselves. Um, so we're going to be here, and it's fun to watch the street. I'm sitting here now, and you know, watching the passer buyers, you know, uh, of all types. And I hope it stays diverse like this. Um, and I was thinking about that often. You know, watch folks walk dogs and and and, uh, and see kids get dropped off with their instruments coming from school, you know, you know, just remembering how it was when, when I was a kid and you, you have an instrument, you're excited about your day, you, and you see this, these different diverse type of groups. And I think that um, some kind of way, uh, and, and also arts is, is a big part of it too. So um, I think there is not one or two people that's putting, uh, planting their, their flag here on Buchanan Street is several, I mean, you have um, Alex Lockwood and his art. He's committed to doing art here. You have you have uh, uh, Rob uh, Higgins with with, uh, with Minerva. You have Slim Huskies. You have the guys at, at the, in the trenches. You have Centric Architecture here with us. And Matt, by the way, Centric Architecture, um, uh, do, they do good, great work. They're co-located in this building with us. They designed the building and we constructed it. So of all these groups to kind of make a commitment here and, uh, and who appreciate the arts. Now I'm a big art lover. We collect and we, we, we even commission some artists to do different things and we try to have art shows. Um, so it's a lot of different things going on. Uh, and, and that's why, uh, you know, Ed's Fish, I mean, I can just name a lot of cool things that we have access to that we would hate to see go away because they uh, couldn't afford to be here. So I think that, um, you know, so some kind of way, you know, and I, I don't make that call, you know, with a lot of those things, but I would like to see that stay. And we, we think that, um, you know, by us being here and being accessible to people in the community, if they walk up and talk to us about what we do, we're happy to tell them. If we see a kid who didn't know about construction and a minority owned firm or, some, you know, folks who do what we do, you know, we love to tell them about it and maybe motivate them to get in this in this profession so it's a lot of opportunity to do all of that okay so it's so you, you've made a commitment uh, your offices are there uh, you're working with um, other organizations to um, promote good development how do you um because I mean, we've seen other neighborhoods just get eaten up 
uh, gentrification. Uh, it just, you know, you turn around and the, the, the neighborhood that you saw is now no longer the same neighborhood and it's, it's too expensive to live in, things like that. How do you, besides locating your office there, how do you protect um, the historic nature of Buchanan Street, uh, the diverse nature of the street, so that it doesn't become something that it's, uh, it, it changes in, in what it is now? Well, you know, Buchanan Street, just like anywhere else, is made up of a lot of personal owned property. I can't tell anyone what to do their, do with their property. Mm -hmm. You know, you as a public official, maybe you can have influence, but if, you know, so what we find is um, a lot of property owners may, may live somewhere else and they just have property in the, in the city. Maybe, maybe someone who lived here years ago, maybe they, they passed on and they left the property to their, to their, to their offsprings or, or relatives, and maybe they didn't really want to deal with it and they sold it off. And who who's buying it and then they control the narrative now and so um maybe they've had a renter there and then when they when, when um when developer uh joe blow comes in and offers him a, and I always use the term a bag of money joe blow offers him a big bag of money and then they said wow it's a big bag of money i think i'll take that bag of money now this you know i don't have any influence on that decision when they make that decision but when that happens is, again, like I said before, the reason why they buy the property in the first place is because there's opportunity to make more money at it. And so that's what we all term to be gentrification. So how do we kind of um, slow that down or, or mix that up? Perhaps, perhaps incentives could, could be made that like, look, um, you know, uh, this young family that the, the girl who got off the bus with her with her flute just walk up the street we want her to can can they stay in the neighborhood well, how do you do that well maybe there's some incentive that some i don't know if the this is a barnes fund type thing that they uh, instead of the developer um just selling it off maybe maybe there's some kind of deal that these kind of families can stay so i you know I, so it's it lies somewhere in there but as far as um, me running down the street. First of all, I have a day job, right? I got to, I got to build stuff and, and worry about my clients and, and, and my employees building stuff. But my heart is like, you know, I, I would love to see certain things happen or, 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 or not change in the neighborhood, but I can't control or influence or tell someone not to sell their property if they, if it's, if it's going to benefit their family. So, um, so how, so how, how do you intervene? You know, who, who intervenes and, and we all see this individually and we kind of watch it happen separately and individually, but, but who can intervene and, and, and talk to that developer and say, Hey, I have an idea, you know, and, and say, why don't you do this? But the developers are quietly individually trying to beat the next investor to a piece of property. That's what's going on. So the, the seller is the seller's marketing he has his, um, I see my buddy Phil Ryan is, is, is on. We talk all the time. I, I advise, get advice from him all the time. It's a seller's market right now. So um, folks are pretty much getting what they thought and more for their properties. So it's hard to step in and say, oh, wait, don't sell your property. Why don't you stay here? So it's got to be a way or communication that might change that. So it's 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 more than just, just, just Don trying to come up with my small idea. But I, it's not a small idea. I think it's a, a big idea. And I, I'm not sure if we have it um, because you see neighborhoods change really quickly. <clears throat> you were, as you were talking, I was thinking because um, you drive by pieces of property and some get left alone. And right. I guess it, it would be my guess that they get left alone because it's zoned in a particular way where a developer can't just come in, take the house down and build two or three they, they might be able to build a, a really big giant um, house, but there may be restrictions. So if no, there's more restrictions, developers are, may, may not buy that lot. Um, I think the concern is that obviously people can make money and it's their property to decide. But um, if there's some incentives in there somehow for them to keep their property or to sell it to somebody else who is gonna keep it the same way, 
then you do have a chance to preserve some of these things. Any ideas on that? I, I think you're well, on it. Well, you know, I think you're, you're on some, but on the other side of that is uh, how do you get them to improve their property? And I think it was something that came out maybe a couple of years ago that um, the city had a fund that they would, if you lived in a certain zone, if, and we'll give you 25,000 or 50,000 to upgrade your facade or something like that to kind of um, improve your situation. So somewhere in there lies some opportunity. I, I, you know, I, I think it needs to be a deeper dive for somebody to really look into that. But, and the other question is, is it, is it too late? Maybe it's not too late. You know, hopefully, hopefully, it's, hopefully there'll be some meat on, uh, uh, as I say, meat on, meat on the bone still left. But right now, <laughs> a, a lot of the meat is getting, it's getting eaten up. So, uh, but, but ideas like that need to be considered. There's still, um, a lot of properties that can be improved. Can they be improved and still and still keep the families who've been here for a while? Because when they when they buy them out, you, we all have this conversation. Where do they go? They're going outskirts where they can't really um, afford to to be to live. Uh, the only places. Um, and I have another concept about that. In my in the con my concept that is a lot of people who are in these neighborhoods who go to work every day, they need to be paid a good wage. They need to be paid a livable wage. So affordable housing could be whatever you can afford. I can't, maybe I can't afford to be in, in, in a um, governor's club or whatever, but I can afford to be somewhere. But uh, a, a livable wage should, should be um, earned by everybody who gets up and goes to work every day. Do you, um... And uh, uh, Brenda Wynn just threw in the transportation piece, which is also a part of this. Um, let, me, um, let me ask you a, a question that came up, particularly as we've been dealing with the pandemic and things, you know, development kept going, but things kind of, people had a chance to think. It was, um, is it too late to turn back for this city? Uh, and what they meant was, you know, there's so many parts of Nashville older Nashville that are such wonderful um, places. Uh, and it's changing right in front of us. And what people were asking was, if we don't do something now, the city's gonna change and, and it's gonna be completely different from what we, what we are, I guess, are kind of used to. Is it too late to, to get some things in place to kind of preserve at least part of what we love about the city? And, other people are going to love that it's become a much bigger city and much bigger development, but uh, I'd, I'd say, no, it's, it's, it's not too late. I think that um, every place evolves It's some, you know, you know, Nashville has evolved to something different. You know, we can't, um, you know, just like, you know, maybe this is a wrong way to look at it, but just like there were outhouses at one point. Now they have, you know, uh, plumbing running water inside. So it, it's the evolution, but, um, what do we want if we take a snapshot of where we are now what do we want it to to be in the next 10 years if you know i can remember when i first moved back i told you i moved back in in uh, it was like 1999 or, or somewhere 2001 somewhere in there and i can remember going to a regional planning summit it was a, it was it was really led by the transportation industry and they were talking about how to plan nashville so it won't and they were using atlanta as the uh as we don't want to grow like Nash, like Atlanta, and um, but it was a good discussion back then. But I, I don't know if we implemented anything that would ke that that's kept us from growing out of control. Or uh, growth is okay, and even we, we talk about business growth. It's it's kind of simple. It's like yeah, you want to grow, but you want it to be a controlled growth to where um, you can still handle your workload in a in a way that is uh, respectful and, and with integrity and not out of control. And I feel like, um, um, you know, if we, if we see where we are now, it's like, okay, this is, it's been a good run. And, 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 and the other thing is a whole lot of things that are, is the city getting anything back that they should are, are they getting the property taxes or developers taxes, not property. Everybody's concerned about property taxes going up, which I would agree, but developers are, you know, let's face it, they're, they're making a lot of money and, and, and is enough of the money going back into the school system and that kind of thing where we need it. I don't know the answers to all that, but 
uh, if we, it, it, it certainly couldn't, shouldn't be too late for Jim for us to say, okay, where are we now? And what happened the last 10, 20 years? Okay, now what, was, what do we need to do for the next 10 or 20 years that makes sense based on what we know now? As they yeah, say, I would, you know, I would agree with you. Better, yeah. you know, so, so no, it's not too late to, 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 uh, for us to prepare for the next 20 years. I, I think it's our, the responsibility to do it. So um, I may be in touch with you after this call to figure out how we, how we do it. it. It does worry. It worries me. I think it worries a lot of us. Um, let me uh, switch to a minute. You're a big art collector. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. I'm really interested to know, um, what do you vision for the city in terms of its, its art? Um, do we have enough? Are we putting it in the right places? What would you say? No, uh, what should we do? Yeah, I think I think um, it's a lot of examples of other cities that's done this stuff. And fortunately, we we have a son that's been in that industry for a while, and we kind of pay attention to what uh, public art what goes on there. I think that one percent fund is a good idea, um, and we need to continue to to make sure there are opportunities for local artists to uh, contribute and let them grow. Um, you know, we oftentimes, even when I, I served on the art commission um, some years ago, and it was always fun to select, uh, you know, a piece that, or an artist from some other, you know, like Germany. We, I was on the, I think I chaired the public art committee when we chose uh, the German artist who did sticks. And so wouldn't it be great to know that we've created artists here locally that can go and do things in Germany or New York or some places, you know? Uh, so I think that investing in um, the, that art and culture is only gonna make us better. And, uh, and, and we, as a company, we take the time to do that by art shows and collecting art. Uh, this piece behind me is, 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 was done in 2009 by uh, James Thrillkill. And I asked him, I said, James, can you do something with my logo? And uh, and he did that, and and uh, you know we we support his work. We support Donna Woodley's work. We support Shabazz's work. We you know we support John Donovan, who's who's doing mugs for us. He's on he's on on uh, Buchanan Street too. He also does work for um, uh, Husk. He does their, their their dishware for Husk restaurant. So it's a lot of a lot of artists that can contribute and you know make it make everybody better so so i think that nashville needs to continue to trend i don't think we're behind i think that we're we're probably in a pace that that it could that could, it could go to the next level so all right let me let me ask you this it's this another tough question um so some of the artwork is amazing around but and it's shown up on brick walls and all kinds of other things but you know you think of um Think of a city like Philadelphia, where they have all kinds of fountains, and obviously you you know you run up the library to the Rocky statue. There's there's certain pieces of art that are there that are just symbolic to the city. Mm -hmm. um, if you could put another piece of art, like a sculpture or something that stands out in the city, where would you put it, and what would it be? Do you have any idea? Hmm. Um. I think. Uh... The park that's, you know, I guess I'm because Buchanan's kind of on my mind, the, the, uh, the park right on Arthur Street, I think something significant should go there. I'm not sure what it should be, but some kind of sculpture that, that you know, that says what the neighborhood has been and, and kind of what binds the neighborhood. Something somewhere in there, Jim, I think is a good spot to, because um, this is kind of a cool kind of a connector kind of a place, you know, walking, pedestrians, biking, um, and it and it's kind of, you know, runs under an underpass. It has that feel to it that a piece of, a good piece of art should be there. Okay. Um, follow up on that one. Now, without anything new, what do you consider to be kind of, is there some piece of artwork that kind of is the symbol of Nashville? And I try to think through that, and I think of Musica, I think of um, the piece uh, on Riverfront uh, Park. Um, is there something that stands out that people do remember Nashville by? Um, um, 
Musica, I was going to say the same thing. Uh, Musica probably is one, um, um, you know, the, the piece that, uh, that Musica was, I'm trying to think of, you know, Sticks make, makes a pretty good impression. Um, but it, some of these pieces don't exactly say Nashville. Uh, when I was on art commission, we had a, uh, when we were choosing the, the uh, Sticks piece, we had to look at three or four presentations. And one of them was, believe it or not, somebody wanted to do a, a large tomato and a rocking chair together. It, it was like a, we were like, we couldn't, didn't know what to make of it, but they, you know, um, you know, we didn't know what to make of it. And I think the committee ended up choosing the sticks instead, but it was like, uh, you know, a lot of people. And, and then I think that we're kind of all worn out on guitars, right? So, so uh, you know, a lot of us who are natives, maybe we're trying to run away from that, that connotation, but, but uh, you know, uh, enough guitars, but I think that, I think that we're looking to, to display something that we're more than, we, you know, we're more than country music. We've been trying to run away from, while that's part of our heritage, we're more than that. So, and then the communities are more than, than, uh, than, than uh, you know, these uh, party buses. So we're looking for something that, that kind of uh, explains a little bit more who Nashville is. So art can help do that. Interesting, a tomato in a rocking chair. It was um, a large tomato. It was like a, like a tomato is like, like a three-story tomato, if you can imagine that. And the rocking chair was like- I, Maybe I could see a catfish. Stories. Maybe a catfish, maybe a bachelorette party in the rocking chair. I, I don't know, but wow. I'm not sure about the tomato. So that, yeah, that would that would be pretty wild there. You got a <laughs> wild imagination there, Jim. Well, I'm I'm just thinking okay. through it. Um, so we've got about three minutes left. Uh, last question for you, because this has been really really fascinating, and um, I'm really interested in a bunch of the things that you're talking about. But um, let me ask you this. It kind of goes back to the other questions, but your vision, your vision for the city, what would you say it is with, a, you know, you've got a developer's hat on, but you, you love art, you love neighborhoods, you want to preserve what's good about this city. What's your vision? What's your vision uh, for the city in the next 10, 20 years? Hmm. Um, you know, I think we we're uh, we're have we have sports to look at we have uh businesses uh starting to thrive but, but i think that uh, uh i'd like to see uh more businesses more small businesses get off the ground more minority women owned businesses get off the ground and and, and thrive um you know and, and uh, you know i guess you would expect to hear that from me as an african american but but i think i don't think we say it enough i don't think we really understand how important it is when you go to other cities that are progressive and, and modern and on a growth tip it's nothing it's, it's not it's not uncommon to see um african-american mayors you know uh the, the the mayor of boston is asian american you know so it's like you know we, we seem to be um it seemed to be taboo to to achieve that kind of stuff so i feel like i feel like we need to be in a more progressive place in the next few years shorter years we need to be we need to it needs to be on it, it shouldn't be a taboo to have an african-american mayor or a female mayor or or asian-american mayor or whatever i'm saying that on that part politically we should become become comfortable with that and and our school system needs to be on a trajectory that that's um that's stellar and 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 uh and uncomparable and, and on the level and kids are learning they they come out really, really sharp and can form it can perform anywhere can get accepted anywhere. I, I think that's where we ought to be. A really good vision. Um, um, I'll be in touch. Uh, okay. I think you've got some um, some good ideas, some interesting that you've got uh, interesting perspectives on on how the city should grow. Don Harden, thank you for being our guest today. Uh, really, really interesting. Um, I'm going to come by Buchanan Street, take a look, see what you're doing over there. Come and, hang uh, out. Um, I, I think what you're doing is really, really great. And I okay. appreciate you being on. Fantastic. So we can fish on Friday. Okay. All right. Well, we can do that. Um, 
So um, we will be on next week. Uh, Andrew uh, Marinus is um, who wrote the um, uh, Strong Inside, the story of Perry Wallace, will be our guest. Probably a um, a really um, a really interesting time to have him as our guest um, with some of the stuff that's been happening with some of the book banning that's going on in the in the state. So we'll have Andrew as our guest next week. Um, Don, thank you again. Stay safe, stay warm. Everybody be careful. And um, uh, maybe next week will be better, okay? Jim, thank you so much, okay? All right, everybody have a good weekend. Thanks everybody.